Go for it. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of life that you have given to each of us and to our congregation. We thank you for the ways in which you have come into our lives as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We pray that your spirit will be with us this evening as we take a look, begin to take a look at the prayer which your son has taught us that we may come to a greater understanding of how we can communicate with you and with one another. In Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 Something I should have done already is ask, who would like to read Luke 11, 1 to 4? Is it Luke 11? That's what I have written down. Matthew 6 is what I have written down. Matthew 6, 9 to 13, I thought. Uh, oh, but it's all graph It says Luke 11, 2 to 4. Luke 11, 2 to 4. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be happy to do that. Okay. And then Matthew 6. I can do that, Charles. Okay. So who can tell me what a disciple is? One who follows. Or a follower? A follower, student? A student. A, and, learner, a learner. And how does this student learn? Excuse me? How does the student learn? By listening. By following by, by example. By listening to? To the leader. Teacher. The leader, teacher. the teacher. And by uh, following an example. Right. And so they, they observe what the teacher says and does. And Jesus' disciples had observed how he very often would go off by himself to spend time uh, praying. And they seemed to know that this was something which was very central to his life, his relationship with his heavenly father. I think that they sensed that he and his father uh, were as one and they wanted to have the same type of relationship themselves. And so this is why they asked him to uh, teach them how they should pray. And so it was that he gave them what we call the Lord's Prayer or what the uh, writer of our study book, the Reservoir, which never will, there we almost had it. What, what he calls the disciples prayer, because this is what the disciples would use as they pray. Uh, it's a model prayer for each of us to use. So Sally, would you sure. please read from Luke 11, one to four? One to four, okay. He was praying in a certain place and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. As John taught his disciples, he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Okay. That's not the one that we normally use. And so it may sound a little strange to our ears. Uh, it's because of that. Revised standard version. Well, it's just, it's just because it's from Luke. That's true. Luke, yeah. Luke has it a little different yes. than Matthew. And uh, our pastor is going to enlighten us with the reading from Matthew 6, 9 to 13. Okay, so uh, Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. 
Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Okay. And so that's closer to what, what we usually uh, use, say, in our liturgy and whatnot, in, in our prayers. Just curious, what, uh, what do you remember as the earliest prayer that you prayed? Sally? Lay me down to sleep. Lay me down, lay me down to sleep? And yeah. come, Lord Jesus, be our guest, and let these gifts to us be blessed. A table. Okay. And Linda? Thank you, God, for the world so sweet. Thank you, God, for the food we eat. Thank you, God, for the birds that sing. Thank you, God, for everything. Amen. You must have been older when you learned that. I could never have handled no. that as a child. <laughs> No. There's too many words. <laughs> yeah. I've even taught it to my grandkids. <laughs> good, good. When uh, uh, Jim mentioned the uh, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, uh, when I learned that as a kid, I learned it, um, Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And it wasn't until Emma came along and I was teaching her that prayer, I thought, what in the world <laughs> am I teaching her? You know, we're tr trying to get her to settle down and we're saying, if I should die before I wake, I was like, uh -huh. so, so the, uh, the actual prayer, I don't know where that came from, but the, the original prayer is, uh, may angels uh, watch me through the night and keep me to the morning light. That was the original prayer, but how, wherever this, uh, if I should die before I wake came into, I mean, I just think that's a cruel joke personally, but it wasn't, it didn't even dawn on me until I was teaching it to Emma thinking, I don't know why that prayer didn't give me nightmares as a kid. That's first probably time, the Germanic, the Germanic version. Probably. That's the one I learned. <laughs> oh. The earliest one I can, prayer I can remember, and I'm not sure exactly, I think it's Abba, but what comes to my mind is Abba, which means but, but Abba, Fater, no, Abba, Lieber, Fater, oh. Amen. You know, Abba is lovely uh, father, Aramaic for, for like daddy. Right. And then Lieber Father is, is loving or loving father. Loving father. Amen. Yeah. That's about all I could handle, Linda, as a child. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, the reason I bring that up is I suspect that the prayers that the disciples had been using were probably more in that vein than, and, and they noticed that, that Jesus spent a lot of time in prayer. And that's what they wanted to learn from him. Uh, what was it that, uh, that his conversation with his father was all about? And so then, we have these versions that, that we've read here. Uh, the problem with the Lord's Prayer or any prayer is that I think the more we say it, we say it over and over again, we learn it from rote memory. Mm -hmm. And that can be dangerous that we, we then lose track of what, what we're doing, what we're saying. Um, I may have mentioned this before, after I had been in my first parish for a couple of years, I still remember telling the congregation that we are going to confess our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. And at the time, the pastor would turn and face the altar, which was up against the back wall. He didn't stand behind the altar. So I turned and faced the altar and I started the creed and got about two sentences into it. And I realized I was the only one saying anything. Uh. And then I realized 
what I was saying from memory was the Apostles' Creed. And I told the congregation they were going to use the Nicene Creed. You know, I messed up because I was doing it from, from rote memory. And I think that uh, ever since then, I, I always try to, to read, say, the Creed or the Lord's Prayer so that I will pay more attention to, to the words. What about you? Do you? Have you ever had the same experience? Linda. When, when I was going through this this morning, I realized that what you memorize as a, as a kid stays with you. Because when I say the Lord's Prayer, I say different words than what we read each Sunday. But when I read it at church, I do it correctly. Even if I am not reading it, I manage to say it correctly. But I, if I'm doing it with the boys or just on my own, I revert back to the Lord's Prayer I knew as a child, which was slightly different. And I think the things, it dawned on me, maybe the things you learn as a child stay with you better than things you learn when you're older. Maybe that's why they're teaching foreign languages when they're in elementary school is more successful. I don't know, but all that just kind of came to my mind this morning when I was doing this. And so I wrote down what I normally say, and it is different than what we read, but just, you know, just a few words are different. Well, I remember when we changed the language, that was a big deal. Good. Well, that's good to know. Maybe yeah. I'm remembering the old language. You are. Because... Trespasses. Uh-huh. Yeah. Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Mm -hmm. And I was raised in the Congregational Church, and we said, forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. Yes. I've heard that, too. And sometimes, you know, instead of he just, in the creed, like when we say he descended into hell, you know, some day, it, it's even a little asterisk in our hymnal, you know, say he descended to the dead. Um, and it's simply because people don't know what to do with that. Some Some traditions... Faith traditions don't know what to do with uh, Jesus descending into hell. Um, Lutheran theology, of course, have has no trouble with that. But yeah, so there's there's all these not only with the Lord's Prayer but with the uh, the Apostles' Creed as well. So um, I don't. I hope I'm not stealing um, Charles's thunder. But if you notice when um, Sally read the Lord's Prayer and I read the Lord's Prayer, there was no doxology in either one of them. Uh, you know, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Uh, you know, it's yeah, just not there. And it, Catholics yeah. to this day do not include that as part, they include it as part of the service, but it's later, they uh, say the Lord's Prayer, and then the priest says more of the liturgy, and then they uh, ultimately say it. But, um, you know, we know that that was added uh, sometime in the first or second century is kind of a, a um, you know, a, a just a kind of close it off in a way that uh, brings it back to praise. Um, we know in the first and second century already they were doing that, but yeah, it's not, it's not within the original prayer that, uh, Jesus prayed. Right. Lorraine? Well, I was just going to say, probably others have already said it, but I can remember saying the Lord's prayer in church before I even knew what it meant. And then when the version came out, like Carol said, and it was changed, that became confusing to me. And then like in the mid sixties, then they came out, I think it was called the good news where mm -hmm. everything was written like no thee or thou's or, and, and now, and to me, I don't think you should change the Bible. It's just God's word. But then I've heard people say my Catholic friends that Pope Francis is thinking of changing a line in the Lord's prayer where uh, he said, um, uh, lead us not into temptation. And they, and they said that God would never lead us into temptation. But, but, I, but I just think we shouldn't change what God did. I even like, for thine is the kingdom and the power. I like thee and thy and all that. 
Yes. Yeah. Can I tell you a funny story? Um, it was about, I probably told you this story before, but it was about a month after I got here. Uh, and there was a, a member who came to the office um, to, to kind of get to know me and so that I could get to know her. And um, she told me that she thought I was doing a great job, but she said, there's one change that I've made uh, that she thinks uh, is going to ruin our church. And I was very intrigued because I'd only been there a month. I didn't remember making any changes yet. And, um, and she said, well, um, the, the Lord's prayer, you just ruined the language. And I was just like, oh, and I was like, well, that language was changed when the green hymnal came out. And she said, exactly. And I was like, well, that hymnal came out in 1978, <laughs> which means I was six years old in my home congregation. <laughs> so that you cannot blame the, the changing of the Lord's prayer on me um, in the last month, because that, that happened years and years ago. But, but some people in their mind, they just, it, it, it just has never been right, you know, after you change the it, we, and by the way, we didn't ever change um, what the Lord's Prayer said. They just contemporized the language. Uh, mm -hmm. Some people do not like it at all, but it, we didn't change the Lord's Prayer, or they didn't change the Lord's Prayer. They simply made the, the language much more contemporary, much like when we had the King James Version and like the Revised Standard came out and then the New Revised. Uh, they were just updating the language as, uh, to help us understand. Because if you've ever read the the, um, the especially the King James version, there are words in there that people have no idea what they mean. Um, you know, in the in like Emma's tradition or uh, generation, she would read like the New Revised Standard, and she wouldn't know what a lot of that stuff would mean either. You know, like um, I could tell you all these examples, but um, so it's not just it's not that we're changing what the Bible is saying; we're just updating the language, and some people don't like that. Uh, and some people really appreciate it. So, but yeah, change is hard. It really is. I, I helped to introduce the LVW when you were six years old. <laughs> and I had to promise one of my members that even though the wording of the Lord's Prayer changed a little bit, uh, we wouldn't change. I think it was the creed, the, the way the creed was said, so that they would keep something familiar. Yes. Yeah. I don't know um, the way Trinity did it, but in my home congregation, my pastor, uh, they printed both versions in the uh, bulletin for years and years, and you are uh, giving people um, the ability to pray whichever one right. that they felt most comfortable with. But then ultimately, you know, we all went to the contemporary version, but yeah, it allowed people uh, kind of um, to, to ease into it, I think. So well, as, as you recite the Lord's Prayer, the um, question is, does it remain the same all the time, or does, does your interpretation or the meaning of the Lord's Prayer change for you, depending upon what your life is like at that time? It, is it always steady, or... Is it maybe more meaningful at times? Mm -hmm. Sally? So life has its way of um, setting you on track at times. So for me, when I say the Lord's Prayer, depending upon what's happening <clears throat> within my life at the time, more emphasis is put on certain parts of the Lord's Prayer for me and its meaning. Um, and it's hard to explain that uh, so that you can understand maybe, but uh, the emphasis is heightened through life's experiences for me. And it could be a weekly thing or a momentary thing, but uh, yes, I think it does affect my, my appreciation and my gratification for various parts of the Lord's Prayer. So hallowed be thy name, you know, giving mm. praise to God as my heavenly father. What, what is, uh, there are different things that may, may occur that gives more, more emphasis on, oh my goodness, thank you, father. Thank you, father. Hallowed be your name and giving praise. And then other parts of the prayer takes effect too, based on the various experiences in life for me. Okay. And Jim? 
I, I was going to say for me, no matter what translation of the prayer may be in, it's really a, an acknowledgement uh, for my need uh, for grace is not partial, but it's really total. And uh, the Lord's Prayer is kind of my foundation to, as I, I really struggle at times to grow uh, in my prayer life. Uh, and just the fact that Jesus says, they said, teach us to pray. Uh, that to me means that, well, hey, it can, prayer can be taught, it can be learned, and that gives me the hope that I, uh, I need, although uh, I have to confess at times I'm kind of a slow learner. Join the club. Carol? <laughs> well, I think um, I pray it differently as an adult than I did as a child, because I um, as an adult, I don't view daily bread as food going in my mouth. I view it as my needs. So uh, I think some of the words mean different things to me as I get older. I'm also, this is kind of interesting, but I hear people pray in church when we pray it and not every pot body pauses at the same place. So I sometimes I pause in a different place and it has a whole different meaning to me. So I think that keeps it fresh and new also it's also my last words before i go to sleep and sometimes i fall asleep before i finish which i used to feel guilty about but then i thought no that's just god relaxing my body and let me go to sleep <laughs> <So>. <laughs> right carol <laughs> oh please yeah let nancy go hey, um the church i came from um is bilingual and several times a year, we would share a worship service and have only one service on Sunday instead of two, one in English, one in Spanish. And when we did the Lord's Prayer, <clears throat> I found somehow it became very moving because we prayed it at the exact same time in our own language. And around you, you would hear Spanish and English all intermixed as we went through it. And I found the experience to be um, just very special. And it, it just brought a really special feeling to hear it, not just what I learned in, you know, as a child or in confirmation or wherever, you know, it was just really neat to hear it in both languages at the same time. Good. It'd be interesting. <laughs> I was going to say, Charles, the, uh, uh, I remember when I was in a confirmation class, uh, my pastor told me that um, you never pray I within the uh, Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's a communal prayer. You know, we pray our Father and, you know, give us this day. And um, that was uh, life transforming for me because I recognized that faith was, it's always communal. Um, you know, it's, faith is always communal. And so it kind of takes it's not just me, it's not just on me or that I have to come up with all the answers or uh, that I have to do all the serving kind of thing. But it's, you know, we are a, a team. We are a community of believers. We are, you know, the, um, uh, we talk about it in the, the, the creed, you know, the communion of saints kind of thing. And that was, it just opened up my eyes to recognize that um, the prayer, the, the model prayer that Jesus taught us is always communal uh, and, um, I just think that's that's life transforming when we recognize that faith is always communal, um, and it's not only the, the the support that we get, but it's the um, um, the when I mess up, there's going to be someone that says, you know, Craig, that's you, this is not right. You know, you are not uh, living according to the ways of Jesus anymore. And I think we all need that at times to say, um, I don't know where you got this idea, but this is not of Jesus. I've hold I've had people tell me that before, and. I just, that, that's so wonderful to hear that because I would probably have never caught that, you know, caught on to that without someone telling me that. Um, and so that's, that's the other gift of uh, faith being communal, that we have people in our lives to say, um, I think you're off track here. And I think you need to reconsider and rethink and continue to pray about it. So it's freeing. And yet I, I imagine that majority of us, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, Take it as a personal prayer, not a communal prayer. Yes. Yeah. And, oh, go ahead. 
Jim? I'd like to, to build on what Jim said. I, I, I think for me, the Lord's Prayer is a, a foundation or starting point. It, it's, I, I guess I would define that this is probably heretical as necessary, but not necessarily sufficient. Uh, I actually find more uh, places to identify praying the Psalms as people used to, uh, the, identifying with the, with the feelings, uh, the faith, the uh, doubt uh, that are, that's present in the Psalms. Uh, so I, I, I think the Lord's Prayer is a, a starting point, but we, uh, I'm not certain that we always help people to build on that, to look for other ways to pray that are every bit as, as powerful and significant and uh, that puts them in touch with their own feelings and with God. Good. Yeah, on Sunday, we're, um, we're focusing on uh, Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, uh, which scholars tell us are pretty much the uh, one psalm that they have split up. But um, that's a perfect example of that, Jim. This guy is down in the dumps and, um, you know, they're in exile, of course. Uh, but, you know, it's a very powerful prayer of just laying it out and not holding anything back um, kind of thing. And, and you know, uh, it's... Um, it's interesting that we call uh, the Lord's Prayer a model prayer, right? This, this is not supposed to be the, the end all of prayer. This is supposed to, as Jim says, kind of the springboard into our own. Um, you know, it's good that we can pray it together communally, I think. But this is supposed to spur more um, our own personal prayers. And, you know, just to be able to, to come to God um, fully and honestly, whatever it is uh, that we're going through. Um, And that's probably why tonight's lesson is really just an intro to the Lord's Prayer. And as we go into it in the coming weeks, we'll uh, go into more detail on, on each line and learn what uh, Jesus was trying to get across to us as far as our prayer life. Jim. Yeah, for me, you know, if I... If I pray the Lord's Prayer uh, by myself uh, here at home, um, it, it has deep meaning to me. But when I do it corporately with, with the congregation, to me, there's such power in that with everybody praying it that I get such an awesome, overwhelming sense of us being uh, united uh, in, in God's presence. And it just kind of opens my heart uh, to a new uh, understanding of, of my own faith and my struggle uh, with my faith as well. But that I'm not alone. Good. Well, one thing that they suggested we do in our, uh, in the leader's guide or in the reservoir was take a look at different versions of the Lord's Prayer. I don't know if any of you have, have looked up different versions. I'd like to read one or two here uh, from the All the House New Testament. It says, Our Father in heaven, let your holy name be known. Let your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today the bread that we need and forgive us our wrongs as we forgive those who have done wrong to us. Do not lead us into trial, but save us from evil. So some of those phrases may put a different bent on, on the prayer for us. Um, one that I rather enjoy reading is the message and this is how he translates the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best. As above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. 
Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're a blaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. I imagine that that's not how many of us have prayed the Lord's Prayer frequently. Well, maybe Nola, but <laughs> others of us maybe not. Yes. Yeah, I love that line, Charles, where he says, save us from ourselves. Um, that's powerful. Yes. Do I remember correctly that one year confirmation kids rewrote the Lord's Prayer? Or what was it they rewrote? Uh, I think, uh, yeah, it was either that or the Apostles' Creed. Maybe it was the Creed. Yeah, and we used it within worship. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they had to put it in their own. We did it line by line, and they had to put it in their own words. So, yeah. well, does anybody else have words of wisdom for us this evening? Jim. I don't know if they're words of wisdom, but I think with the Lord's Prayer, again, whatever translation we, we read it in, uh, that the focus is always the same. The, you know, the first part is, of course, on what's the Father's purpose? What's his will? And then the, the rest of it, uh, the focus is on our needs, our family's needs, our personal family needs, our church family needs. And to me, that's that's just what it's all about. Yep. The other Jim. I think I would I would add that uh, that we tend to think of prayer as a one way form of communication that we're we're praying to God uh, and uh, I I think a uh, a part of praying this prayer meaningfully for me is not only to say the words, but then to listen to what God is saying back to me uh, as a result of, of this prayer, the way God is speaking to me and what God is asking of me or expecting of me uh, in light of, of my circumstances and what I've prayed. Uh, uh, I think we tend to just say it and be done with it as if it's one-way communication instead of two-way communication. Yes. It's all our work and we don't have time to listen. To my, uh, when my uh, spiritual um, director in seminary, um, she said, you know, we say amen way too quickly. She said, we need to learn to pause. And, and I was like, okay. And she said, so when you pray, she said, take about five minutes before you say amen. I'm thinking, five minutes <laughs> do you know how long five minutes is but you know but it's it's right you know it's we we say uh, we always give our i always say we give our laundry list to god and then say amen you know take care of that and we go on with our lives and you know maybe god has a laundry list for us as well we just have to take the time to listen so okay as i said this is uh an introduction to the Lord's Prayer, and we'll start going into more detail in, in the weeks ahead. Um, so unless someone has words of wisdom, and since I didn't uh, ask someone to close with the Lord's Prayer, and, and since Marsha's not here, I'll go ahead and do it. Thank you, Charles. <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 And that's from Amen. the Lutheran Book of Worship, Jim. In case it seems strange. <laughs> now, now. I forgive you for putting me down, Charles. <laughs> and God would ask me to do. <laughs>
Can I say something? Yeah, Please hold up, hold up. Let me, yeah, just thank you, Charles, for leading tonight. So um, sure. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn off the recording and then we can continue to well, talk. Okay? Do you want, Nola, do you want this? Oh, in the recording, yeah. Nola? No, no, that's okay. Fine. Okay. So I'll see you all on Sunday. God bless. Thanks for okay, being thank here. Thank you. Bless you. Bye. Bye.